just a thought, just a thought. It's my opinion, it's just a thought, just a thought. Get out your feelings. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Just a Thought with Sheree Nicole. And I'm super excited, y'all. I've been trying to get this interview. <laughs> I don't, maybe for like eight months. I'm just going to say eight. I feel like it's been a year. Don't but, do that. <laughs> but Don't I'm do that. grateful to, to God to say that Monica McNutt is here with me right now. I'm so excited. She's a basketball analyst. And if you if you love sports, and even if you don't, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. She's a basketball analyst, host, and reporter. She's based out of New York City. She joined the ESPN family in 2019. And uh, in addition to those duties, she's also a studio analyst for the New York Knicks. And uh, she's just all over the place. I was talking to her earlier. She's always traveling, always moving and grooving. She also earned her bachelor's degree and completed her career as a standout women's basketball player at Georgetown University. And uh, she's a woman after my own heart. We got a lot to talk about, a lot going on in the sports space and in her life as well. So without further ado, Monica, finally, what's going on? Cherie, hey girl! <laughs> we made it. I, I'm, 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 I gotta process that intro. I don't think it's been eight months, but maybe, possibly. Well, I met, quick story, I met you officially at the Final Four last year. Mm -hmm. Women's Final Four. I in believe that was in the top of April. Yeah. Um, and that was initially when I shared with you that I had a podcast and I'd love to have a conversation with you. So it is February, um, of oh, the next yeah. year. So I was being nice. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't been a year yet. Factually. It has not been a year yet. We did not make a year anniversary of me trying to make this happen. Um, <laughs> so for that, I am grateful, but you know, Monica is so much going on. Super Bowl just wrapped. Chiefs just won. I want to talk to you about that first, and then we'll move into a little basketball talk. Okay. I was actually pulling for Philly, and okay. I was looking at Sports Center earlier today in the conversation. Actually, it was Get Up, Get Up Mornings. And there was a conversation around, okay, did the Eagles blow it, or did the Chiefs just come in and do what the Chiefs were supposed to do? So based on what you saw, did the Chiefs win this game outright, or did the Eagles blow it? I mean, I definitely think everybody will point to the holding penalty during that last drive. Yeah. But I just think the Chiefs did what the Chiefs do. And it's so funny because I literally was having this conversation on Friday with Pelicans head coach Willie Green. Scratch that. Not Pelicans head coach. Cavs head coach J.B. Bickerstaff about his squad last year. Quick little basketball tie-in. And he talked about competing against teams that have been there, that have the experience. And the language he used that I thought was so powerful, have the ability to raise their level. Yeah. Now, you could argue that raising your level was benef was a benefactor or that look the benefactor of raising your level was the penalty, right? Yeah. Well, even if you want to get down to the nitty gritty of that, a team that has been there, done that, mm -hmm. is going to cut, going to run this route with extreme diligence, going to put a defender at a bad position. Obviously, I don't know what kind of shot they gave Patrick Mahomes at halftime because his ankle miraculously <laughs> was much better. Um, but I think you heard Travis Kelsey say a post game as well. We played an uncharacteristic first half. Mm. We got ourselves together as a group at halftime. Second half, you saw a group that had been there, done that, and was able to yeah. raise their level. Yeah, I echo your sentiments. I feel the same way. I, I mean, when I saw how they came out swinging in the second half, I said, oh, that's what veterans do. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like if you're Philly, if you're not able to really – you know, drive that screw and turn it, you're always in trouble. Like, you're never mm -hmm. safe. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we can see Jalen pull it out next year. Um, but this year goes to Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. And before I come off the Super Bowl, there's always been a lot of talk. There's still a lot of talk about. And I think it's too early. This is just me personally. Mahomes being the GOAT. There's so It's been so much GOAT talk with your family over at ESPN. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it, it just He's got a long way to go. But there's been a lot of GOAT talk. Your thoughts on Patrick Mahomes potentially being the greatest quarterback of all time? I think there's a lot that goes into the GOAT conversation. And it is a very personal rubric that allows one to establish that. Yes. But what I do agree with is if he is to maintain this pace, mm -hmm. we are being set up for something historic. I think that is a very large if. Because I think even the greatest athletes will say you need a little bit of luck, right? Yeah, yeah. Whether it be injuries, teammates, negotiations, um, injuries on other squads, whatever. Um, I think that that's still a big time if. But I certainly can understand why people are so excited about it. 
Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Before I move into basketball, which is both of our loves and prides and joy, uh, I do want to just go back a moment to, you know, your basketball history and then how ultimately that, you know, trickled into you becoming one of the the top and dopest voices, in my opinion, um, on, on ESPN. So for you, and, and I'll just say from my personal experience in playing basketball, like growing up, that was my life. I always thought, oh, I was going to play, play, play professionally. And it just was how I identif- identified. Um, and so I got to a place where I was like, okay, I can do something else. Wow. There's, there's TV, there's radio, there's writing. Um, for you, what did that transition from college basketball into, you know, covering sports on the broadcast side look for you? I love the way you just recapped your story with such a smile and a sort of. Oh, it was traumatic. I was Girl, just I was trying to be poli- say- politically correct. It's all right. It was it was traumatic. I was about to say. <laughs> I honey. went through a whole depression and everything. I Girl. talk about it all the time. Uh, Sheree, girl, I literally, so at Super Bowl, I flew out to Phoenix for my good friend Latanya's story, her PR Love agency, Latanya. she puts on the sport, you, yes, you know Latanya, yeah. she puts on the sports power brunch for women in the industry, um, and it was beautiful, but I ran into Janelle Bailey, who two years out now, I believe, was a standout at UNC, mm-hmm. and she's navigating her transition, and I'm talking to Monica Wright, former UVA standout, WNBA champion, just yep. joined the front office of the Phoenix Suns. And so the three of us are sort of standing there and Monica is married with a baby and now with the Suns. I am along the way in my career and Janelle's sort of like us 10 years ago, right? 10, yeah, 15 yeah. years ago. And so she's just like, I'm just trying to figure it out. And we're looking like, girl, we have all been there. <laughs> like you're going to figure it out. Yes. But we have all been there. And I think it's so important um, in that part to young girls as you begin to navigate to grieve the loss of your career and your identity, yeah. so to speak, as an athlete, right? I, girl, I can remember very vividly being like, I'm going to get a boob job. Like, it doesn't make sense for me not to have any boobs anymore. Like, I'm not but, an athlete. <laughs> the, the, sis, we're like the same person. I don't know what's going on. Girl, I was so set on this boob job. I'm so glad I did not do that. Um, But it's like, there are so many things that yes. go through your mind. Yeah. Not to mention, girl, I did insanity. I graduated in May. In December, I had these pants that didn't fit. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. Yep. So this yep. is what happens yep. when you're not practicing for three yep. and a half hours a day and lifting. <laughs> Let me get this together. So I remember doing insanity, that crazy program. And it, it did work, but it was like, okay, now you need to figure out what fitness, wellness Absolutely. Help looks like when it is not demanded of you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I reflect now on that period. And while it, I'm sure you know, while it was uncomfortable, it also is sort of beautiful because you are able to lean into something else. Yeah. And I used to always say, if I'm not giving it the energy and the commitment that I gave hoops, then I don't really want it. Because that, you know, that got you Monday through Sunday. Yes. There was no time that was too early, no time that was too late, no tournament that was too far. So um, that is continues to be my thermometer in terms of how badly I'm working toward a goal, which I think um, helps me keep myself honest, so to yeah. speak. When, um, did you, when did you know, too, that, okay, I can love journalism, I can love broadcast journalism just as much as I love the game of basketball? I think for me, I took a class the second semester of my senior year um, in journalism, and I just, our, the first week of class, our professor whose name I'm blanking on, but I can see her face. We still exchange emails every now and again, just to check on one another. It's a black woman, tremendous career, long time journalist at the Washington Post. I'm so mad. I cannot wow. think of her name. Anyway, um, she was the first week of class. She's like, write down something that you're curious about. Hmm. And I loved painting my nails. I still love painting my nails. It's sort of my, my thing. I do it in my quiet time, change my nail color every week, whatever. Um, and so I was like, why, why are so many salons uh, run and owned by the eight members of the Asian community. Yeah. And so ultimately she's like, okay, well, remember those questions? Pick one, that's gonna be your final project, right? Like that's your that's your final reporting thing. So I remember working on it throughout the semester. Um, and that last week it was due, it was really kind of like that deadline stuff. I got some calls back from some folks I was tracking down. Like I'd gone out to some nail salons, got people to talk that new history, blah, blah, blah. And it was sort of this thrill and pursuit of journalism and just asking and answering a question that I was genuinely curious about. And so I would say, I was definitely hooked on the reporting aspect from that experience, but I also was fortunate to intern at NBC Sports Washington, Mm. NBC4 in DC in the sports department. And so that was the other 
added ingredient, we'll say, because I felt like I'm probably not going to the W. Overseas, I was iffy on. And so when I was mm-hmm. bit by the journalism bug, it was like, well, I don't want to be an ocean away and not strike while the iron is hot, so to speak, yeah. having gone to the NCAA tournament with Georgetown and nearly knocked off UConn and having a little bit of buzz in terms of people yeah. knowing who I was. So that's kind of how it all pivoted for me. In terms of the commitment, girl, woo! <laughs> Girl, um, God. So I actually went to grad school. So it didn't really get real for me in terms of what it took to navigate this business until 2016, I think. Why are we the same person? I did yeah. the same thing. It's so weird. Yeah, like, and girl, I had so, like, I, one thing I'm very proud of is my network. And I always, I tell young people, and I walk by it, you take yourself with you wherever yeah. you go, right? Yeah. And so you are your walking, living, breathing, business card reference, the whole bit. So I'm proud of my network. After grad school, I got into grad school through networking kind of referencing. I was sitting at a table at a Washington Post event and flatly told the table, well, my career is over. I'm trying to get in journalism. Mm. Would love any advice. Turned out I would be sitting next to George Solomon, who has become certainly my career godfather. But at the time, he was directing the Shirley Povich Center for Journalism at the University of Maryland. Wow. He's like, come check us out. Ended up being a fellow. Knock out my grad school work. Um, Finish up in grad school. Again, follow up with these people. They're University of Maryland alums. Landed like a job at the community station. At an NABJ event, Um, Maureen Bunyan was being honored for NABJ, NABJ Excellence Award in D.C. Go to the event. Meet um, Leon Harris, who's a big time anchor in DC, telling him my aspiration. He goes, I can't necessarily help you, but I know the guy who can. Turns mm. around and introduces me to the news director of ABC7 at the time. He's like, Okay, well, let's meet, blah, blah, blah. I think you know how you're networking. Yeah. I think I'm just going to go chat with this man in the grand scheme of things. Maybe it'll pan out in a couple of years. We go, we chat. He calls me back a week later and he's like, I can't offer you the job you wanted because I thought I was supposed to be the lead sports anchor in DC at 22, 23, whatever it was, 24 maybe. He's like, but I do have this MMJ position and I'll let mm. you focus on sports. What do you think? Had no idea that that was a job interview. I'm like, I think yes, sure, great, love it. Wow. <laughs> um, So my first couple of jobs out came pretty seamlessly, but then that job, Sinclair came in and bought the station. And so I was a part of a group that was laid off. And even in that, it was like, okay, I've done these projects. I've met these people. Let me tell these folks. Um, Dwight Feeney. Dwight Dwight Wings was his name. Um, I called him. He's like, give me one second. Sinclair at the time was launching a sports network. He calls me back. He's like, meet with these guys. Sure enough, these guys are like, come on down. We need an anchor, whatever. You're familiar. Take this job. Move to Florida. Relatively seamless. Girl, then that gets shut down. So this is my second layoff now in a window of three years. Wow. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I can remember thinking when I left the crib to go to Florida, girl, we up and up. Like, I ain't coming mm. back. You know what I'm saying? Like, we up and up. Uh, definitely drove home with my tail between my legs. <laughs> it felt terrible because mm. my mom is looking at me like, no, nah, I feel bad. Like, I did something. And all that mm. all my parents had done was be there to catch me. Yeah. So I had to work through that. And as I reflect back now, Cherie, and I tell young people, old people, anybody when I discuss my story, the 18 months where I could not land a job um, and I was incredibly frustrated with myself, with God, the whole bit, I wouldn't change it for the world because it was the most powerful exercise in separating who I am from what I do. Mm. And I think back now, and my grandparents have since gone home. Um, my guy baby is getting bigger. Like there is no pull up on your grandparents just to kick it. There is yeah. no picking up my guy baby from school. There is no playing in the alumni basketball so- association um, and reconnecting with friends from college. Like the freedom of that period, I don't know when that will be recreated in my life. I don't know mm-hmm. if it will be recreated in my life. And so, I saved that time. And I rem- I'm so thankful that it took me maybe about halfway through to start to really grasp that in earnest, to really let go. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of allow God to work and do his thing. I, I had released this stuff. I had genuinely released this stuff and was like, okay, well, 
I was substitute teaching at the time. I was teacher cycle. I was like, if I'm going to go in the classroom full time, coach basketball on the side or chase this media thing on the side, fine. Like my heart will be okay. My life will be okay because joy is based on what's internal, not external. Mm. And so I literally was like, okay, that we this this the new plan. Like it's cool. I, I did I did all that I could, but the bills are not waiting. Life is not waiting. Um, this has to take a different form. And so I was prepared to do that. And then the beauty of black women and networking and being willing to willing to put yourself out there in a meaningful way. And I can remember being so like struggling with pride because I had always had full time jobs in the space. So this idea yeah. of freelancing was like, yeah, I don't, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Little did I know how powerful it was. And so I can remember tweeting out a reel because I learned that you had to let people know that you are able and available, mm. that you can't, you, you have, yes, you go and beg for work. Like, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever um, asking looks like to you before it feels demeaning of yourself, that's what you do. You go that's and ask good. for work. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I can remember tweeting out my reel. My good friend LaChina Robinson was leaving Fox at the time. She's like, Mon, these are the people you need to email. I'm vacating these games. They're going to have openings. Fox would give me one game, maybe two. And I was like, mm, maybe they don't like me. Um, I tweeted out this reel. Jamal Hill picks it up, Maria Taylor picks it up. Um, retweeting, encouraging comments. Didn't necessarily translate in that moment, but it was sort of the validation. Yeah. Yeah. So someone to see. Exactly. So December 20, Lord, all the pandemic years j- jacking me up. December <laughs> 2019, I think. No, cause, no, no, no. Because 2020 was pandemic. So this was December 2017, maybe. Um, No, it's 2018. Yeah. December 2018 was that little wink. Okay, we got this. Fast forward, starting to pick up more work consistently with Fox, picking up work at CBS, really kind of working this freelance thing over time. Mm. Like, Girl, there was no company that I would not work for. <laughs> Have check, let's talk. Like, I jokingly would be like the Chris Brown song. These job hoes ain't loyal. Like, I'm finna work for whoever trying to work. Let's work. And I did, Shuri. I did. <laughs> I was working. My parents would let me get get myself together. Yeah. You know, we, we landed on a little piece of something, something in terms of rent. But, like, it was really a work and kind of restore all that I thought I had been lost. And restore, mm. girl, honestly, two, three times falls over, right? Um, and so it was a beautiful period of my life. And I can remember in March, we hadn't quite a start a roller yet. Just paying my bills, right? Like, you know, when it's tight, you real. Right. I'm Let me get, get out it the right. way. Girl, this number comes up on my phone. I'm looking like, because I, I ain't never had no bill collectors call me until that season of my life. And they would call and I would be like, listen, if you look at my bank account prior to this date, I'm very diligent. I'm just in a rough patch right, right now. I'm going to get to y'all when I can. I promise so this number calls and I'm like, Monica McNutt's phone. This is Pat Lowry from ESPN. I'm like, oh, uh-huh. I know who you are. How can I help you? So it turned out she needed me to come in and fill in as an um, analyst for the women's ACC tournament. Mm. And so that turned out to be my impromptu audition for ACC Network slash ESPN. Um, and again, success happens when preparation meets opportunity. Knocked it out of the park. And sort of the rest is history in terms of helping me get to ESPN. Now, how I moved yeah. over to the NBA side is another story and advocating for yourself and letting people know that you are available and able. But I just, I really thank God for this story because it makes me so much more relatable, earnestly. Yeah, yeah. When babies say it's tight, I'm struggling. Yeah, I know. Like, girl, I remember getting the W-2s back from that that first year before things started to pick up um, after the 18-month window. And been like, I really grossed 25 grand this year? Like, that was it? What? <laughs> like, how? And I think the thing that blew me away and that I will never forget looking at W2 was like, but God kept me. Girl, yeah. I wasn't hungry. I wasn't wet. I wasn't cold. Um, we had a plethora of different challenges in my family. And I was able to be there earnestly and attentive. Yeah. Um, it truly worked out the way that it needed to be. But I, listen, like, been there, done that. And so... I'm just so thankful for that because I think in all of that, it also frees me to roll as me. Yeah. Because I've been without this. And not that I don't enjoy my job, not that I'm not living a great life because of my job, not that I have any plans to go anywhere right now, Mm -hmm. but in terms of perspective, if I feel like I can't be me, it's not worth it. And my, my heart can be 
whole and my life can be good in another way. Like this is not the yeah. end all be all for me. You know, it's interesting when you say you can be you. I remember when I first saw you on ESPN and I was like, <laughs> <"Dude."> <laughs> like I can do this. <laughs> there's, me. Uh, th there's an unapologetic, authentic, incredibly intelligent, smart, aura that you carry into ev every time you hit the screen and I hadn't seen it in that capacity mm -hmm. on ESPN I don't think ever mm -hmm. and so with that being said when did you find your voice and was mm. it challenging for you did you ever find yourself in positions where you had to fight for your voice because you are coming from an angle for me that yeah it's polished but it's also got some grit to it mm -hmm. that I think serves to balance out the overall coverage that I see on, on ESPN? Um, I don't know that I ever, I should say, I don't know of a seminal moment where I found my voice. I think I have incredible parents who always encouraged us to think things through and to share what we thought of the situation. Now, did it need to be done respectfully? Did you also need to understand time and place? Yeah. Yes. But I never felt, I don't remember feeling stifled as a child. Uh, it was Monica, calm down, be still, like that kind of thing. <laughs> but mentally, uh, intellectually, I don't remember ever not having a voice. Um, and I went to predominantly Black church school. Then I went to a Catholic all-girls high school. Um, and so I had very contrasting experiences, but yeah. I don't ever remember not having a voice. Even if like, you know how sometimes it can be with your elders, leaders, whatever, yeah. old folks, grown folks. Even if the question was disrespectful by whoever standards, there was a way to ask it. There was a place to ask it. There could be an earnestness in the conversation. And so I don't ever remember not having a voice. Mm. Um, I think for me, the lesson has kind of been just how impactful your voice is and can yeah. be because girl i was good for putting on a cape on behalf of my classmates or teammates <laughs> whoever and that's sometimes you can do that and sometimes it's not your cross to bear right mm, yeah um for two reasons one you need to mind your business but also like that person may or may not want that advocacy yeah and so now before i jump in the fire on somebody's behalf if we have that a sincere relationship i will often be like hey do, how you want me to play this um and so that's something that i'm still learning and navigating but i i feel like i've always had a voice in terms of fighting for my voice I'm in a sweet spot, Sherry, because, or Sheree, excuse me, because I was kind of given credibility as a former athlete. Yeah. That allowed me to just operate in that space without needing to polish in the way that a reporter or a traditional anchor might need to. Makes sense. Um, and, and I honestly wanted to go more of the reporter anchor role because I just had so much respect for beat reporters that were on the ground, people that were traveling um, with these teams that were in it day in and day out and it felt like the studio was sort of removed. In my role now, I have been able to navigate both, which I yeah. think continues to give me credibility. But um, once I kept banging my head at the wall a few times in that role, although folks are still approaching me about that now and realize that I can truly hang loose, whatever, yeah. be authentic yeah. in the analyst position, um, I've definitely leaned into this a great deal. I talked to you a little bit about this when we first met at uh, the Women's Final Four last year, and, and it was about just the challenges that um, you would like address when it comes to Black women in sports broadcasting. And there may be a young lady listening now who's like a former athlete like us, or maybe not, maybe just wants to be involved with sports on this, on the broadcast level, but, you know, maybe running into some some mountain, so to speak. So for you, you know, what are what is like one kind of void that you would like to see filled when it comes to uh, either representation for Black women in the sports space or just something that you'd like to see change? I think representation is the top line, but I think for me, that looks like the opportunities and the pipeline. Yeah. Um, when I think of my Black women colleagues outside of, First, women's college basketball or WNBA. Then NBA, the numbers start to trickle, dwindle, excuse me, significantly. Yeah. 
mm. NFL, Lord knows college football, <laughs> um, baseball, hockey, so on and so forth. Um, now, I can think of women that are passionate and qualified to be speaking in all of those spaces, but have they gotten their national or mainstream opportunities? No. Um, and so I think Black women in particular, but even if you expand it out to whatever you believe diversity looks like as we proceed as a country, as a nation, as sports consumers, it can't be an afterthought. Yeah. Because you know how difficult this business can be early on. And so if there is no light at the end of the tunnel, so many people are forced to jump ship because of necessity. Right, right. Right? And so when we have a conversation about pipelines, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to hire a person as a PA and allow them to matriculate all the way up to on-air talent in your network, but who are you following and at least giving an girl or, or attaboy and we see you that allows them maybe to, okay, if I can piece it together for this little lo- this much longer, maybe something will break. Or what entry-level positions do you have that people can actually graduate mm-hmm. through and from to get on to, 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 grow on to, to grow on to bigger and better things? Mm. Point well received. I like that one. Let's talk a little basketball. We'll we'll start with LeBron first. Um, mm-hmm. I'll just you know I I'm I'm from Chicago. I actually started playing basketball because I was watching Michael Jordan religiously with my family every day. Um, and so he is still the goat in my book. I actually have Kobe ahead of LeBron as well. So Le- LeBron comes in as as a close third for me. For me. Um, for you, we're looking at him just just you know uh, bypassing Kareem's scoring record. Lots of talk about him being the GOAT. This is probably one of the biggest arguments I've seen on social media for at least the last seven to seven years, at least. <laughs> um, we're all arguing. It, it's, it's interesting. We just won't stop. For you, you know, keeping the scoring record break, break in mind, uh, where does LeBron sit in the GOAT conversation and rankings for you and why? Girl, unsolicited, my dad went on a rant about Kareem. <laughs> we, girl, we on the phone. I don't even know what we were talking about. I was hoping that I was going to get uh, the call to do ESPN Radio for that game. And just completely unsolicited, my dad goes on this whole rant about the rules and the three-point line and what Kareem did. And I'm like, Dad, you good? He's like, yeah, but I'm just saying why, <laughs> why Kareem's still the goat. And this doesn't count. I'm like, doesn't count seem strong. But okay. That doesn't count, Dad. Right. I feel feel you. I think it is very much uh, generation-based. I tend to fall back on the rings. Same. Which would be Michael for me. But I do acknowledge that what we are seeing from LeBron has literally never been done. Facts. Uh, And not just the length of his career, but the way that he has adapted his game. I mean, this man is top five, I believe fourth right now in assists, and he just notched the scoring title, right? We have not seen someone so versatile in terms of position and positionless basketball. Now, that's no knock on Bill, Kareem, Michael, even to a degree. Yeah. That's not the way that they played. But I think if I had to plug and play guys from errors, LeBron, Mike, Kobe, translate to me. Mm -hmm. I would need to, and Michael Wilbon will be so upset (laughs) if he heard me say this, but like, I have to go back and watch more YouTube study clips of those guys. I mean, the Skyhook, Probably can't defend a sky hook in this era of basketball either when yeah. you talk about Curry. Yeah. And Bill Russell's like size is something that you have to contend with. But I don't know, is he as physical? Like does, does Bill Russell give me yeah. more KD I don't think he was as, as a post skilled. player. I don't think Bill right. Bill Russell was, was fundamentally sound. He revolutionized the way the game was played by being a leader and fundamentally sound. But if you want to talk about flat out skill, right. That's a whole different conversation. So that's what I'm saying. So I think I tend to fall back on rings still. Yeah. Yeah. Which is Michael. For me. Uh, The the rings argument gets a little bit wafty (laughs) for me when I go Kobe versus LeBron. Yeah. Um, But you easily can make a case for anybody. And if I were to walk into the barbershop and was arguing, I would just be arguing for the sake of arguing because I agree with everybody. (laughs) 
I think it's interesting. I was watching um a video on social media the other day, and it was so cool. Jalen Rose uh, was talking about why he thought Michael Jordan was still the GOAT. And one of the points he raised I thought was pretty cool. He was like, what if Mike never retired? I think it says a lot about his greatness that we're still factoring in the potential of what could have been <laughs> when mm-hmm. we talk about him him being the best. I do want to shout out LeBron as well, as you said. I mean, this is this is something we've never seen. And also, I think it's also a credit to how well he's kept his body. No season in the end yeah. in 20 years. Um, I don't think we can, we can't say that about anybody we just named <laughs> outside of him. So, you know, we'll see. I, I don't, I don't foresee him winning the championships. I just don't. And I've said before, I think the rubric, we need to all have an, a, a corporate agreement that yeah. the rubric is no longer rings. And if you want to have that conversation, then we can shift it. But I'm, I'm with you on the titles. And speaking of LeBron's chances, the, this has one of, been one of the weirdest, craziest <laughs> trade seasons Girl. in the NBA I have ever witnessed. I'm 36. I have ever witnessed in my life. What? <laughs> Girl. What is going on? And, you know, for you, Kyrie is over here. Now he's in Dallas. KD is with the Phoenix Suns. Westbrook is out with the Lakers. I mean, it's been so much tic-tac-toe checkers and chess being played over the last few weeks. What say you to everything that's been happening? Girl! <laughs> I am still wheezing at CJ McCollum <laughs> tweeting <laughs> that this is all Jaws fault for saying he's good in the West. <laughs> Because that could not be more iconic <laughs> in terms of a way to encapsulate the power shift that we all yeah, just witnessed. Yeah, huge. Um, Katie is from the crib. One day, someday, I'd love to get a little bit more inside track. Although our my colleagues, Brian Winhorst, Ramona Shelburne, have done some really great reporting. I think that that trade goes down because he handled it so respectfully. And it was, yeah. a, it was in the quiet of the night kind of thing. Um, and Sean Marks, by all accounts, is respected as a basketball mind. And I'm sure there's some relief that Brooklyn can just move on. Like, yeah. let's just move on. Uh, that was not a bad team before they like get, they got rid of Kenny Agassin and brought them dudes in. Thanks. So um, I'm sure there's a sigh of relief over there. And as someone who works for the Knicks locally here in New York, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I I tried really hard, Sherry uh, Shereen, as uh, there's my homegirl Sherry. Actually, she just recently left CBS Sports. I believe she went to NFL Network. So I'm to Sherry Burris. You are Sherry. No, that. no worries. Um, <laughs> Sherry, I think I tried really hard to be respectful in my commentary. Um. And I still think I've handled Kyrie with respect. I think you can disagree mm-hmm. with how someone operates and be respectful. Yes. He is probably one of the more challenging folks to cover mm-hmm. and to comment on because it doesn't make sense to you. But in that same breath, like, mind the business that pays me. It doesn't have to make sense to me. Like, he's got to do what he believes is best yeah. for his life. Uh, do I think that he is going to have a wonderful remainder of the season in Dallas? Yes. Do I think that he will be in Dallas and be unscathed in terms of other things off the court? No. <laughs> no. Um, but as far as the basketball goes, cool. As I understand it, if he wants a four, he wanted a max contract, Dallas isn't in a, isn't in a position to max that. But if he goes and helps Luca win a championship, which right. I don't think is going to happen, like we scratch each other's backs. Talent still trumps all in terms of people being willing to take on Kyrie. Yeah. It's like that woman that thinks I'm gonna fix him. Are you okay, girl? <laughs> Come on up. Okay. <laughs> fix him, sis. Let us know how that goes. <laughs> it's because if you look at just the overall pathology of how his career has fared, it's like, okay, we we've, we've seen this story multiple times. And to your point, I wish him well as well. The the thing about it is I don't know if Kyrie is content with being the Robin to someone's Batman I mean the reality is yeah Kyrie's a franchise player but you go to Dallas it's Luca's team Uh so I don't I don't necessarily see him in the long run being okay with that that's just my personal opinion I do think that there's a window on that but he was supposed to be the guy in Boston he didn't want to be the guy anymore right like um, I do think having 
I don't know if flip a coin on whether it was him or his team or Katie's team in Brooklyn. I do yeah. think now he has a much more sincere perspective on what it costs to be the guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of opportunities to go places and win, I am curious about how other NBA players feel about him, right? Like the Twitter likes to say, you don't hear a bunch of other guys talking about him. Well, you don't hear a bunch of other guys coming to his rescue either. That's so true. which that's true, yeah. Whichever, like, do you guys are quietly minding their business and they fine, or do you buy that guys are like, nah, keep that dude out of here? And you, you know what I mean? Um, there are to me, there are a few other superstars left in the league that I think have the personality to be like, hey, dog, that's not what we're doing. Right, right. Like I obviously Dame comes up in terms of Portland mm-hmm. and Dame's window. But I don't know about their personalities. I don't know where they stand, good, bad, or ugly, or indifferent, off the court. Um, and they're at their size, their games are very similar. LeBron obviously wanted him. Okay, LeBron is one personality that's going to squash everything, and they have history. Yeah. Um, but as I look around the league, I think it is so clear that Dallas' Lucas team, that they're in a position to take that gamble. But in terms of the risk, he's not a personality for Miami. Um, the teams that are actually trying to contend, I don't know. I I don't get the vibe he's a personality for Toronto, but I wouldn't be mm. shocked because they have shown us that they're willing to hire mercenaries a la Kawhi. Max. Um, Cleveland said he's definitely not going to Milwaukee. Like we're now talking when this Dallas thing is over. Yeah, yeah. I uh, don't see him gelling in terms of the leadership standpoint in a in a Memphis. Denver, no. that doesn't even seem like the type of personality. Like, you know what I mean? So, like, yeah. Utah is rebuilding. Your opportunity is to find a spot where you are actually in a position to contend. But I didn't think KD was going to get moved in the middle of the night either. So I could be totally wrong. <laughs> Look, 1 a.m., what are y'all doing? But, yeah. and, and speaking of KD, I mean, and this is the thing. I love KD. And I actually love Chris Paul. I, 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 I'm a fan of, of what's been brewing over in Phoenix. My concern is, Chris, what else can can the Lord send your way? I, I don't I'm not certain what what other blessings can be bestowed upon him for him to win a championship. Do you see it happening? It's championship or bust. Yeah, like is, you gotta retire. Is. Like you have to and I'm I'm literally talking this year. I don't even want to give him enough. This year you need to do it. Or you gotta go. It's, it, it is championship or bust. I'm not going to say, I, I kind of feel like it's this year, personally. I agree with you. I'm not that, I don't necessarily think Chris has to retire. He should retire when he's ready, whatever that looks like. He might be a Udonis Haslam type. I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> but in terms of what Phoenix leveraged in this trade, yeah, this is the year. You've got everything you need. Everything. Yeah, like, this is the year. This is the year. And I think, you know, uh, when the trade first went down, I remember being on with K. J M Keyshawn, J Will, and Max, and the bench was brought up, and I'm like, well, outside of Denver, you could pick apart most teams' benches if you wanted to. I mean, Milwaukee's got really good depth. Cleveland has depth, depending on how well they're playing. But like, right. no team is going to be perfect as we enter this thing. But give me the team with that much firepower and the ability <laughs> to play some defense. Yeah. Like, Obviously, they took a hit defensively, but like yes, they, they do did. still have the ability, and they've got the pedigree of Kevin Durant now, and guys that are hungry having gotten to the finals yep. two seasons ago. Yep. I mean, that's a little that's scary. I'm pulling for him. I, I really, I really want it for Chris Paul. I really, really, really do. Chris, if you can hear me, I'm praying. <laughs> I'm praying for you, brother, because I want this for you. I want this for you. I, I want one for him too. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to see him get one. I mean, out of what was what was the the trio? Uh, I guess it's D Wade. Well, maybe technically it was D Wade, Melo, and Bron. But if you throw Chris in that same sort of core group, yeah, the Banana Boat Boys, right? Like <laughs> Chris ain't got his yet. Obviously, Melo didn't get one. We're Sad. gonna see what ha- we're gonna see what happens. We we do know that Ja is not all right anymore in the West. Um, so- <laughs> 
I do know that <laughs> tough, tough loss to the Celtics last night, but I digress. Um, but it, it'll be interesting to see. I'm excited. I'll be keeping up with all your coverage. Obviously, All Star uh, All Star games coming up. So excited about that. So we'll 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 see. Um, before we go into what you got coming up next, who do you have coming out of the East? Who's your favorite now? Uh, my longtime favorite was Milwaukee. I showed it we do the other day, and I had to stick stick a pin in it, and I switched to Boston. <laughs> Boston's guess, looking really good right now. Yeah. Really um, I like I like what both of those teams did at the trade deadline. Uh, I think Muscala stands to be a little bit more impactful than Crowder. Crowder is comparable to P.J. Tucker, but not quite P.J. Tucker in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I, I – my thing with Boston is I, I just – I I'm, Joe Mazzula has done an incredible job. I don't know if Joe Mazzula is going to start calling timeouts in big time moments. Mm. And uh, Mike Budenholzer has been there. And so if the teams are even, it comes down to the X's and O's and the coaching, yep. right? Yep. Although Bud was getting crushed for, couple, <laughs> for some of his decision making as well. And his staff looks very different. Uh, he's got guys that have gone and taken head, head coaching jobs. So I think right now I'm, I'd still roll with Boston if okay. they are healthy. Um, and then out of the West, you got to take you got to take Phoenix, and I love yeah. Denver, but I think you got to take Phoenix. Sounds good to me. I'm I'm with you on that. We'll see what happens with the Bucks. Um, they're 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 kind of tied Boston and, and and Milwaukee for me, but it, at any rate, it's gonna make for a great uh, NBA playoff season. So looking forward to the All Star Weekend, uh, Monica. You know, I know you have a life outside of all the amazing things that you do in front of the camera. <laughs> What else? You know, it's fun. At the, it's always fun interviewing people at the top of the year because it's like, oh, it's first quarter. We got all this year to go. It's <laughs> optimism. So with that said, what else can we expect from you besides the amazing coverage that you provide us daily on the screen? Oh, uh, girl. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I think for me, lifting as you climb, Connecting in meaningful ways are also important. I don't know if that looks like a, a formal foundation, girl, because you know mm. we need a tax write off, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we keep it a buck. I'm still trying to find something to help me out. Jeez. Girl, if we keep it a buck, uh, I don't know if there, there is a formal institution of that in this calendar year, um, or if it's just kind of continues to be grassroots for me. That's something that's, that's so very important. Um, I think staying connected to women's basketball. My role yeah. has changed a little bit this year for women's college basketball just because of my schedule, but the W this summer should be really exciting. Um, I'm not sure. I think I'm still working it out. I like that. I like that. And that's okay because we all are in some, in some way, shape, or form. We all are. You all make sure to, Monica, I want them to get your social media because it's very, very inspirational, okay? Whether you're a fashionista <laughs> because Monica's outfits are fire. This is every day. She Ugh. already told you she changes her nail color every week. Okay. Yeah. So she's she's lit on the fashion side daily. And Girl, then she's doing me... kettlebell workouts. I do, I do love a good That are workout. monstrous. Mm -hmm. So how can people follow you on social media? Because I want them to be inspired on all these different levels. Um uh socials are all McNutt Monica. And I think it's so funny because I just I I want <laughs> my socials to be real life for me, right? Yeah. Every time I got a fit on, shout out to my stylist, Sydney Page, who's excellent. Because if you catch me, it is very much giving Savannah James watching her boys at a high school event in sweats and something like super chill. Like, probably a hat. Like, if you just catch me on my own time, <laughs> mm -mm. Uh, it is definitely Sam's makeup and lashes and very much, if you look at the wrong angle, you might think it's a prepubescent, prepubescent young man. But it's not no! me. I promise Oh. No! <laughs> I will not accept that. No. <laughs> um, I just I think it's funny just to kind of tie all that in to the question you asked me about this year. I really want people to be comfortable. Yeah. And honest, like with themselves and with those around them. Um, I love getting dolled up, right? But I'm also as content in a sweatsuit and a cap. And I think, especially for our young girls, yeah, um, the versatility. Whether you mm -hmm. want to call it code switching in the way that we speak based on what the environment demands or what the environment demands in terms of how we show up and dress. Like there are so many different facets of who we are and all should be cherished and celebrated. 
Absolutely. Now, there should certainly be a through line and symmetry, and they all should connect. And at the root of it, your character should be the same. You take yourself with you wherever you go, as I said. But I, yes. I think to box ourselves in in one particular role is to deny a whole plethora of things that help make us who we are. And so I'm just Absolutely. with being able to be aggressive with the KBs, cute at the brunch, <laughs> like maybe sleep, hair flat, like all of the things. Give me all the things. <laughs> I love it. You have certainly been all of the things, um, a huge inspiration to myself and I'm sure so many others. I'm so grateful. We finally made it happen <laughs> just shy of a year. I am so, so grateful. I hope to see you soon, guys. Monica, she's she's busy. So when she comes to the A, she don't have no time for me because she's she just gonna, in and now. She got to. We're going to do this. We're going to do this KB situation this summer for sure. Yeah, we got to figure it out. I, my we're trainer, uh, Katie with the muscle has a kettle cynics class with nothing but kettlebells. I don't really like kettlebells, but Monica adores them. I love them. So we're going to put something together this summer and, and do some kettlebell workouts. But Monica, thank you for your example and all that you're putting into this, uh, into the broadcast journalism and sports world. It is not, um, I don't take it for granted. And it's, it's just very refreshing. So I appreciate thank the you, conversation Sheree. and the time. Girl, thank you for this space, <laughs> for, for all the essence work. Like, we love to see it from you as well. So thank you, friend. It's just a thought, just a thought, it's my opinion.